we're all still here, I'm, I should have made it longer, I guess. Um, Lance, are you still here? John? I'm so honored uh, that you all came tonight. Thank you very much for coming out, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> John Dorshuk, he's the director of the Office of State Archaeology uh, in Iowa City. And this is Lance Foster, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Iowa Tribe. And he came all the way from Kansas to see us tonight. Isn't that nice? Anton, you're there, thank you. <laughs> there are so many people who participated. Uh, I, I want to, in particular, uh, also mention Jonathan Buffalo and uh, Preston Duncan from the Meskwaki tribe, who uh, I, I guess couldn't be here tonight, uh, but they were in a, a, a real huge help and just fabulous. We, we wanted to give everybody a feeling of what happened be before we all got here, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, so, so with the help of a lot of these people, with about 75 volunteers, and you saw all our supporters, you notice I didn't want to come on stage because uh, musicians were all local or locally connected musicians for all of the music that you heard. Uh, let's hear it for the musicians. <laughs> Sharon, are you here? Sharon Bousquet is, came all the way back to visit to Thank you. <laughs> and those little guitar little licks that, that were going on the whole time, that, a lot of that was Sharon and was really, uh, I'm not gonna mention everyone because that's why we do a credit roll. <laughs> because I know that if I mention somebody then I'm not gonna mention a lot of other people and that would be, uh, too bad. I do, I do want to just say one thing before I take questions. Um, the reason we did that little trailer in the beginning was to tell you that this is a series that we're planning, and this is the first of eight films that we're planning to do about Fairfield's history. I mean, it must be crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so we thought we would start, even though we're not going to do chronologically after this, we thought we would start with understanding where our land got created. I, uh, I thought that whole thing about the, um, uh, the Decorah impact and that crater and everything and what we learned about this area, that we were all on the equator. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so I thought you'd all want to know about that. And I've talked to a lot of people who know a lot of things about when the settlers got here and so on, but not many people knew a lot about this. So I figured we'd start here and try to get all our knowledge about this kind of together. This isn't exhaustive. You know, I, we did an exhaustive amount of research. We took almost a year and a half to do this first film, which I talked to somebody who was giving me advice on documentaries, and he thought it was going to take me six to seven years. So I guess we did all right. <laughs> but I was thinking it might take me nine months. So, uh, uh, um, and. It, and this is our, my first film, so uh, I, I think I'll be better next time. Um, so, questions? Are there some questions that people have about the, the film or anything? Yes? I just want to say, it was a class act. Jason Strong is right there. Jason, would you stand up? He's our director of photography at the Fairfield Media Center. And I can't tell you how many times I asked him to come over, and he said, really? I, I'm, you know, my, my wife's not going to like this. <laughs> and uh, she was, her, his whole family was very understanding. And... Uh, I sure appreciate it because he's a real talent 
and I think we pushed each other, you know what I mean, to, to be better. And that was the whole idea is to, um, I didn't care that I hadn't done it, I cared that we tried to do it as best we possibly could. And, and uh, very talented camera people, very talented editor, uh, Jeff Boopy, and, and sound uh, mixer, Tim Britton, really helped out a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make one little pitch, and that is, this is so gracious of the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center to uh, have us here, and, but I, I do want to say that the, the projector is fabulous for what it does, but the picture is actually much clearer than that. It's just that when you project it with this projector in such a big way, um, it lost a lot of that definition. So me, at knowing every little tiny piece of every little picture and a clip, I was like, oh, that, that, didn't, that, doesn't, that looks a little fuzzy, you know? So um, we decided to make this available streaming online and um, available for download on Vimeo On Demand. It does cost $3.99 if you want to watch it or I think it's $14.99 if you want to buy it, like buying a DVD, but it'll just be on your computer and you'll be able to watch it anytime you want. <clears throat> and for those of you who know how to take it from your computer and project it on your TV, you can do that. So, um, and it is much clearer and the sound is really amazing. So, I thought people would want that and I know a lot of us, I know I have family that is, uh, doesn't live here but wants to see it, of course, especially my 93-year-old mother will. I'll buy her the three dollars and ninety nine. <laughs> Not gonna make her pay, but uh, but anyway, you can do it on Vimeo on demand starting at eight o'clock tonight. So uh, we'll figure that out now. Questions? Are there some? We have some amazing people here uh, with a lot more knowledge than I. But any questions on anything on knowledge? Yes. I have heard. Just to the great mind, that this area had been a place where the tribes, even when war, would come together out of issues and trade. And that Fairfield, as we know it, Jefferson County, as we know it, was that place. And they would lay down their arms and they would trade. Is that true? Oh, so the question was that um, the person had heard that Fairfield was known as a place where other tribes would come to meet and put put down their arms and and meet in peace or or or, uh, or discuss peace or, or or work together. And was that true? And trade, and trade together. There were some places in Iowa that had, were like rendezvous points. Um, one of the best known ones outside was uh, Prairie du Chien. Um, generally places where people met together, they didn't live because it was neutral ground. So no one could really claim that. Um, there were places that were, in fact, Dick told, uh, took me to one of these places today that had a lot of power, a lot of uh, power in the land. and. Um, I can say this is this is definitely one of those places. Um, a place where they also used to lay down all their arms was up at Pipestone, um, where you couldn't go in without it, with any weapons, uh, and you had to behave a certain way. So there were neutral places, a lot of times and places. So yeah, you're you're living in a sacred place. And, and you heard John mention even in the film that the way the land is situated, it would be a natural place being on, on kind of the uplands to, uh, for people to come together and it seems like, I don't know if you wanted to. I, I think that summarizes yeah, yeah, okay. it pretty well, yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. One of the things we tried to do is bring together stories that I've heard of. People's like, like our, um, our artifact hunters. Is Gary Nelson here? Where are you? Thanks, brother. 
probably met about 20 artifact hunters, and I'm sure there are a lot more, but Gary is a pretty amazing guy. And uh, so those are people who know the land and, and actually find things on the land and in streams. He knows every nook and cranny, and he walks it all the time, right? So then I meet Lance and Jonathan, and they're from the tribes themselves, and they have an under, another understanding. And then I meet the scientists who don't like when I come to them with stories, but want to know a little more about the facts that as the, of what they actually have studied. They actually showed me pieces of pottery that are 5,000 years old that were dug maybe even by Anton there, Anton Till, Anton, wait a minute. Anton's a Parsons graduate and he lives in Atoma and he's done probably been associated with more surveys of and archaeological digs in Jefferson County than maybe anyone else. And he was a great researcher. <laughs> and I might add, he told me a few stories about Parsons, so when we do that movie, <laughs> uh, no, no, we'll get to that later. <laughs> no, he actually told me some very sweet things. Just so you know, by the way, we're, we're doing, um, we're recording some of, of each of the films now. Even though we, the next film we're focused on uh, very clearly, we still might do uh, one on Parsons if someone comes from uh, to an alumni meeting, let's say, and is from uh, another town and we would like to do that interview. Uh, or they're 93 years old and we, we'd like to catch them while they're still fresh. <laughs> <laughs> and happy. Yeah, uh, Lance was asking about the next film. So um, I will tell you, the next film uh, is called Heroes of Fairfield. I'm very excited about it. We're gonna tell six stories of people, just ordinary people or groups of people from different time periods in our history in Jefferson County. And just ordinary people who did some extraordinary things. That, that, that changed not only Fairfield, but but but, may have changed even the world, or parts of the world. And there'll be some really, I'll give you one, only one. <laughs> We're doing a lot of research right now on the Underground Railroad in Fairfield. And, uh, I will, we will post more of them because I am very open to anyone who has knowledge about anything. I track down more things that weren't true than that were true. And uh, that's part of the job, right? And uh, some of them might be true, but I couldn't prove it, and I didn't want to show it to you if I didn't know. So sometimes we hinted at things, like the thing you were tell telling me about. We hinted at it through what John said, without actually saying it because we didn't feel like we could definitively say, oh, we talked to these people who met here, or there are these recordings or things. It's one of the challenges, by the way, about the Underground Railroad is not many people were talking about it who were a part of it. So uh, we're meeting, we're, we're, we're having a lot of fun with that right now. Um, and I think you'll love that film when it comes out. And I'm hoping it comes out in nine months. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. I came here to Fairfield in 75 and um, uh, as a business student at MIU when it f pretty soon after it first opened. And uh, I've been in business pretty much. My wife and I got married at the Bardite Chapel the day after we graduated in 79. We went back to my hometown in New Jersey for a few years, but really decided that Fairfield was our home and we just came back here within our first child. We had five children total. I coached Little League and uh, was very active here in a lot of different things and uh, kind of feel like I have my feet and hands in a lot of parts of Fairfield. I really, I've been here 40 years. I really feel like I'm from Fairfield. This is my home. And this is where I brought up my family. And um, as some of you might know, I was, a, a, I directed the All Things Italian Festival for 10 years, and, uh, and 
And that was over and uh, kind of completed and I felt like it was done, you know, and uh, stick a fork in it kind of thing, you know, so I just told Karen now we're empty nesters and we can move on and then uh, I had this idea, I saw some video of some town that they were doing a little history video and I thought, you know, we should tell a story about Fairfield, what a really crazy unique place, you know. And then I wanted to tell the story about the university and all that. And then I said, well, what about Fairfield before the university came here? This is an amazing town, you know? And then I said, well, let me see what's been written or what movies are written. There is nothing. And there was one good book, and that's A Fair Field by Susan Fulton Welty, who I thanked in the, uh, here because many times I read that book, thanks to the Fairfield Public Library, who. <laughs> was very patient with me, saying, do you want to maybe check this out a little longer? And <laughs> yes, nine months? No. Um, so uh, Rebecca was very, very kind to me. Um, we have a great resource in our library, and, and I've been starting to tap it, and I'm only just begun. <laughs> and uh, because don't forget, there's not a lot about the Pangean shift of the continents, you know? So uh, anyway. That's my background. I told my wife and my wife Karen, right there. Right there. And uh, I have a most unusual wife because she said, you, this is what you want to do. So you have a whole background in business and everything and you want to produce a film, a documentary about history? Like you have never done anything really about history. I said, oh, I've always liked history, you know? Like, but I just had, it just grew into this unbelievable passionate desire to tell this story to everybody. And that I, I, the goal of the series is to bring us all together a little more. That we're all so busy with what we're doing. If you're a farmer, you're busy. You are like doing your thing. And that's what you do. And maybe you go to your church or you spend some time with kids or grandkids, but otherwise, how much do you know about what goes on on campus? Not even that if you wouldn't be interested, but who knows about that? I'm doing what I'm doing. And the same with people on campus. What do they know about what's going on there? And all different type parts of our community, we know what we know about. And I don't think it has to do as much with that you don't care. You just got your thing that you're doing, you know? And this is supposed to, we're going to do, I'll tell you, so we're going to do this Heroes of Fairfield. Then we're going to do one on the history of agriculture in Jefferson County. And I'm really excited about that. One. All about from Native American agriculture, the settlers, the family farms, the big ag operations, and uh, even the sustainable organic, everything. I want to know about everything. And I want to see it, and I want everybody to understand a little more about each other. That's my goal. Then the history of economic development here, how the first businesses and how everything developed from there. What grew, what happened, and, and how it went down and how something else came up. I think it's worth knowing. And even up till now and some of the things that are happening right now. Then we're gonna do one on um, Parsons College, a whole film on the 100 year, pretty much, history of this amazing institution. Then we're going to do one on MIU and MUM. I just got a word from them that they've opened up their archives to me. So we'll be able to tell people what really is going on and not what they might have thought or whatever. And, and that'll be interesting, OK? And then, and then I'll tell, I want to do one on our artists and musicians in Fairfield and their influence on our society throughout time. And then the last one we want to do is the future of Fairfield. And I want to really get a young director involved with me. I want to tell the story about the, some of these under economies that are kind of underground, that are the kids are doing some amazing things, the people who are moving back into town, what they want, what they're seeing, and some of some what we think are going to happen 20, 30, 40 years from now. I like people's opinion. Maybe we'll laugh at it 20 years from now, but I'd still like the opinions and, and see it. And I'd love, my goal is to end that one with a big party in the square where everybody from the entire county comes out. We're gonna have 12 cameras. Everybody who wants to be, no, say I was here at this time is gonna come. We're gonna try to get 
a bunch of food places to bring some free food or very inexpensive food, because I know people will come for the food. <laughs> and uh, I did the Italian festival. And, um, and then we'll, we'll have four drones that'll, that'll lift up. Speaking of drones, where's Renee? Did you like the aerial footage on this? That's Renee Holmberg. And, and he is an unusual talent. Thank you very much. Um, he did some amazing work. And uh, so anyway, I, I'll tell you a quick story about Renee. So Renee and I are out, and I don't like one of the shots that we got. I want to get it better on one of the fields. You know those field shots? They, they look like they're the same, but they're really not. And we use a few different ones, and it's kind of, you know, how he goes right across the field, and then it opens up. Those are kind of nice shots, so I wanted to go out one more time. So just only a, maybe a month before the edit, final edit, I want to go out one more time. So Renee goes with me, thank God. And, uh, and Lance had told that story, remember, about the deer and the deer spirit and all that? So we go out. Yeah, I know. Isn't that great? I love this. Story. And uh, so we go out, and as we're going by, we do a sweep through, and then Renee turns that drone around, and we're catching the field, and he goes, he, we're looking at his iPad, and he goes, uh-oh. I said, what, uh-oh? You know, I'm always don't like, uh-oh. And, uh, and I'm looking at it with him, and I said, is that a deer? And he goes, yeah. So he brings the drone right next, near the deer, and the deer just turns and looks at it like, who are you, you know? <laughs> And then it just starts, turns, and it just starts bouncing and bounding away. And he goes, I've got this, I've got this. And I'm like, oh, there's the, there's the deer story. <laughs> so they're just little things that sometimes make you feel like so awesome, like, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> and it was, uh, the, the, we had a lot of those. I called the guy, you know that one where the um, iceberg is crashing? Yeah. So that I found on YouTube after three or four hours. And I found a, there's a lot of things of calving, they call it calving of, of a big iceberg, but none where they land into what I consider like a river, which is what I wanted to show for Iowa. It's always into a big ocean or a sea or a bay. Or I finally find this one, and it's spectacular. So I look up the guy, because you can't contact him through YouTube, but I look him up and find a thing, and now it's like 11.30, and I'm not usually much good at 11.30, but I, for some reason, I'm sticking with this one. And I write this guy an email, and I said, I gotta have this, you know, footage, but we don't have any money, you know, so <laughs> would you be willing not only to let me use it, but for free, pretty much, you know? And the guy writes me back and says, I do research in what is it? The Arctic Circle or something? And I can't believe you just got a hold of me. I'm leaving in four hours for six months. <laughs> he goes, tell me about your project. And I'm like, now it's 1140. And I'm like, oh, Fairfield, Iowa. Da, da, da. And like, I'm sure he's thinking, Fairfield, Iowa, you know, like. And I'm telling him about, you know, everything about where it would go. And he goes, you have my full, uh, you know, um, permission to use this free of charge. He goes, by the way, I've never let anyone use this stuff free of charge. And it was very nice of him. And, uh, and then he had some, some fellowship or something that he was, you know, like Dartmouth College and Dartmouth University. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, this guy probably actually, somebody knows him. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I want to tell a little story on Dick here. Uh, <laughs> Just to, just to put the question about filmmaking in, 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 in the perspective. Um, a lot of you know Dick better than I do by far, but everybody knows he likes to talk, obviously. Um, that, that probably is good if you want to be a filmmaker. You've got to talk people into stuff. But, but uh, uh, my office gets contacted reasonably regularly by somebody who has some idea about the past and, and how to interpret it. And, and uh, so when Dick first called, um, I was uh, in sort of that uh-oh mode of uh, here's, here's another one. And uh, some, of, some of the ideas that Dick first pitched were, um, were a little bit out there. And they, they didn't show up in this film, though. And, and I'm very pleased with that. Uh, <laughs> but, this is, but this is where we get to, to why I think 
Dix is a successful filmmaker. He's going to make a lot of films, I bet, before it's all said and done uh, that are going to be as good or better than this. Uh, and that's because he has a passion, but he listens as well. And, uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and not only does he listen, then he goes out and he educates himself, and he talks to more people, and he learns a little bit more, and he starts piecing it together. And I saw a pretty remarkable transformation within months from first conversations to then developed ideas, and then when he, he and his crew came to the office, they learned a bunch more, but then went and reflected on that and came back and said, we need to do this, and we need to talk about this because I've learned, and, and uh, I think that's remarkable, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so do you want to say anything about what a great guy I am or anything? <laughs> Well, I can follow up what John said. Um, our, our word for it, to listen is nachum. Nachum means uh, he does listen. Uh, that's a good name for him, I think. He listens. And a, a big mark of that is, uh, is the meskwaki. They don't talk to anybody, just anybody. And the fact that they connected with him and, and talked with him and, and that he filmed them. And, and Jonathan, I know, I've known Jonathan since I went to school here in the in the 90s, and Jonathan is a kind of a kind of a shy guy, you know. And uh, I tell you, he got stuff out of Jonathan that very few could. So that's a sign right there. That's a mark of approval right there. I was actually thinking you were going to tell much worse stories, but thank you. <laughs> you know. Um, it's funny, I was telling Lance that I, I first tried this and I was trying to like, okay, so let me tell about the Native Americans. And then I was talking to Lance and a few other, and they all say, a lot of them say Indian a lot of times. So then I'm like, so now I was talking to someone in Fairfield and said, yeah, I'm working on this thing about the Indians. And like, they're there, don't say Indians. You know? And I'm like, I have a special dispensation from Lance Foster. <laughs> So I felt better. <laughs> it's very interesting, just the things you learn. And uh, I just felt it was important. I, I just want to say this one last thing. I, I think it's important that our kids uh, know what the history of this place. And they, they have access now on a phone to almost all the information that they could possibly want to know. Some things we don't want them to know. <laughs> and yet sometimes they've lost their connection to the land that a lot of us feel that this is our home. My feeling is this, is a, I have a little fire pit in the backyard, so sometimes a few friends come over and play a little music, maybe we have a glass of wine or a beer or whatever, and we're looking at the fire, we talked about this, and we, we look up at the sky and the stars, and I'm thinking, this is pretty good, you know, and I start thinking about well, who made those stars, and how little we are, you know how you think about when you look at the stars. And, and then I think, um, but lately I've, I've thought more like, well, well, there was somebody that was sitting in, the, in front of a same fire, maybe at my house, or maybe down the block, or maybe a half a mile or a mile away, a thousand years ago with their friends, looking at the same fire, looking up at the same stars, but they're different color skin, they were talking a different language. When I came here in 75, most people were white and they were talking English, right? And that was just fine. That's how Fairfield was at that time. Now it's actually a little different and uh, that's okay too. But interesting that 300 years ago or 400 years ago, they were all talking, nobody was talking English. And I think it's good for us to just realize that, like, oh yeah, that's, that is interesting, you know, that our home that we think of was like, it was always like this. Well, no, it wasn't always like this. Even the weather was different. Even the, by the way, did anybody notice that armadillo in that picture? <laughs> Giant armadillo? Well, I want to explain that to you because it kind of got edited in such a way. The climate wasn't just colder in the Ice Age. You tell me if I'm right on this. <laughs> it was more drastic. So it was warmer and colder. Right, Anton? Anton told me actually about this. So there were giant armadillo, because in the warm time, they come up and they're, they were here. 
but there were also 300 pound beaver, and, uh, and this is only 13, 10, 12, 13,000 years ago, not really in the scope of things that long. There were huge, there were mammoths and mastodon walking right through Spearfield Square. I just think our kids would want to know about that. <laughs> Don't you think? And um, I tried to do it in a movie because I think they can relate to a movie. We actually put this movie together in such a way that eventually I'll be able to break it up into little pieces. And so the kids that maybe if they're <laughs> attention span gets smaller and smaller. They'll be able to just want to know about the Mastodons or about the Meskwaki or whatever and be able to kind of find that out. And we're going to work with the library to get all this information available to them. I'm also going to work with some of the schools to try to get this information out to them. Uh, so we're just working. <laughs> the first film, a lot of people I would tell them, oh, I'd like to get this in the Fairfield schools. And they looked at me like, uh, let me put you to someone else, you know? <laughs> like, I think they felt the way a lot of people felt was, let's see the first film. <laughs> and then we'll let you know if we have an interest. But I'm hoping after they see it and see how serious we are about this, that they'll do it. I, I wanna make sure before I leave that we think our major supporters that helped us, our businesses. I'm not gonna name them all. We have a big sign outside, we had it on here, but they were extremely important to us. Uh, and, and I really thank them because they took a chance on me before we had the first one out. So uh, thank you. question was, he wanted to know when the last Native American left Jefferson County and if they're still here. Well, um, it depends on the tribe, you know. Uh, the last Iowa kind of left Iowa by about 1838. That's why you don't hear much about us. It was really before settlement started. The Meskwaki are still here. They're up there around Tama Toledo. And um, as far as other people, there are a lot of people I wouldn't doubt people right in this audience that are descendants of uh, Native people, of various tribes, not just from here, but from all over. So that's, that's one important thing to remember. And not all of us look always to the Indian. Uh, my tribe suffered 80, 90% uh, decimation rate over time, mainly from diseases and things. And so a lot of us intermarried with uh, local farmers and stuff. And that's what, I'm not as dark as I might have been. Uh, we're like Indian corn. If you remember Indian corn, it's speckled, and you've got some dark ones and some light ones, and that's the way it is. The same corn cob, you know. I, I would say, just as I said in the film, though, that we are still here. We're still here. We're in the we're in the land itself. We're in we're in the wind. We're we're everywhere. We're here. <laughs> I want you to understand something about Lance, you know, and I'm going to brag about you a little bit, just for a second. Lance is doing amazing work with his tribe. He's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, right? And he's trying to bring back a lot of their knowledge of their language that's been lost and teach it, some of it, on YouTube and Facebook and stuff like that. And, and, and he's even, I understand, gone to different families. Oh, what words do you know still in those families? And gone all through, so it's, plus any books and so on. So he's, he, he just seems like a simple guy, but he actually is a pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how he is. I think uh, in, this, in this process that I've gone through, his friendship is one of the great blessings I, feel that I've gained from doing this film. So. And, and anything else? I think we'll take one more and then maybe we'll, yes. I can. Years ago, there were petroglyphs in Cedar Rock that have since been stolen. Is there any oral tradition of that and what they may have said? Sean? <laughs> we don't have any record of them, unfortunately. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, the question was about uh, petroglyphs that had existed in cedar, cedar bottoms, uh, but they are destroyed now, I take it, or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so apparently are, are not existent at this point in time. So the question was about whether there's any uh, record or oral tradition about it. On the archaeological record side, my office doesn't have any information on that. Anything on the oral tradition side? Uh, generally where there were petroglyphs or pictographs, it's not just what they said or what they symbolized. It was that there were marks upon a particular place. As you were saying earlier, um, it uh, is a special place. It's places of power where where the creator stops for a moment and, and there's all that where he touches the earth in a special way and that still remains from the original creation. So a lot of those um, those pictographs and petroglyphs, they sometimes move in a lot of the traditions too. They kind of take different forms and they, like a sitting bull, when he had his vision, um, he saw the petroglyphs up there in Montana kind of go upside down and, Talk, talked about how the fight with Custer would go. So a lot of, all over the country. Now the sad thing is, is that people don't understand when you take um, things like that, because you think, I don't know what it is among people that they want those things instead of leaving them there. It's sort of like taking a bird and putting it in a cage and then it dies. The problem is, is those things are alive in their own ways. Um, and, but wherever they were, even if those things are chipped away, there's a mark on that land that means that that place is a, is a sacred place and was seen that way from the very beginning. So I think that's one thing to remember. Um, we, we didn't have any stories that remained for us from that. And I'll tell you why, because on one of our traditions is you don't talk about tragedies too much. You let them lay, you let them be, it's too much pain to bring it up again. I know our culture today discuss all the things you went through and all the pain and everything. I know there's value in that in many ways. But our tradition is if there was a destruction or something terrible that happened, we just walk away from it because you have to go on. We're going to go out uh, in, in, into the hallway. We may be able to say hi to a few people out there. Kim Halra has dinosaur guy from Fairfield. Kim is an amazing guy. Kim, are you here now or did you leave? He's out there. Yeah, yeah. So Kim is uh, Kim is a guy who was, he and his partner found uh, in South Dakota, found a juvenile T-Rex. And so he has his own uh, kind of uh, moment of fame. And actually some top paleontologists in the country that I talked to knew Kim. They were Kim Hallers in Fairfield, Iowa. So we have a, kind of one of those that happens a lot in Fairfield, where you talk to somebody about Tim Britton and uh, the Alien Pipes, and they go, "Tim Britton is in Fairfield, Iowa." Uh, so I just want to say one more time, thanks for coming. You, by the way, uh, there were a bunch of people that unfortunately came a little late and didn't make it in, and I feel bad. I hope they come tomorrow. I hope you tell all your friends to come tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. So they could see this and uh, and share, and we could share it with them. Um, I, I really can't tell you, you know, put a lot into this, and there's a lot of people that were part of it, and it really meant a lot that y'all came out tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs>